good. Okay, so you hold that for, on, for me, and then I'll just talk into this, and then I'll pass it over to you. Perfect. Okay, so hi everybody, welcome. Um, this is Hera Galleries, The Green Stitch, and it's an eco craftivism group, and we luckily have monthly speakers from environmental groups around the state. And the Green Stitch came about through the Rhode Island Foundation in conjunction with the Rhode Island National History Survey. And today we have Paul Clappin um, of the River Herring Collective and Bill McCusker of Friends of Saugatucket. And we are on Main Street in Wakefield, sorry, <laughs> at the Saugatucket River. Okay, super. Oh, so I'll cool. hand it over to them. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming out here today. Um, you know, to talk about the river. And I'd like to thank the Hera Gallery for inviting us. This is a wonderful opportunity to talk about what's going on at this very moment within our, the river in South Kingstown, Rhode Island. Um, so uh, my name is Paul Clappin. I'm with the River Herring Collective. It's a group of volunteers. We have a little, a little over 100 volunteers right now that um, our primary focus is the river herring. So we do anything we can to help the river herring come through to migrate to get to Indian Lake. So their, their ultimate goal is to get up to Indian Lake to reproduce. So it happens in a two month time frame, and this is really go time for us. We do, uh, we assist DEM in counting of the fish. If you have a chance, you know, before you leave, take a look right at the mouth of that uh, fish ladder right there, you'll see a whiteboard. So this is a whiteboard right there where our volunteers will look down, 10 minute time frames, count the fish, and then enter it into a database for DEM. And all that information is used to determine how many fish are migrating or spawning in that particular year. We also uh, clear debris from the river. Bill and I have, have gone up and down the river, uh, clearing out large obstructions, whether it's fallen trees to help you know, ease the passage for the uh, river herring to get up. And we do lifting of the fish. So uh, lifting of the fish happens when uh, they stack up in certain pinch points uh, along the river. And our volunteers will go with nets and lift the fish from below the dam up above. So we'll talk more about that soon, but that's basically my group and what we, the overview of what we do, but we'll talk more about that, Bill. And I'm Bill McCusker, I'm with Friends of the Saugatucket. We are a new watershed group to protecting the watershed of the Saugatucket River. We kind of took the torch from the old group, which was the Saugatucket River Historic Corridor. They did wonderful things, including this walkway that we're standing on and Sari Sanctuary on the other side. They also established water quality monitoring into the river, which we're going to continue with once we get proper funding from hopefully businesses and volunteers in this area to establish a good water quality monitoring base to understand any changes in the river and to maintain and keep a good archive. Uh, we work with a lot of different groups. Save the Bay we're working with, the Salt Ponds Coalition, who we are close partners with, who's helping us get established, Rhode Island's Rivers Council. We're also working with the River Herring Collective, the Woodpockatuck Watershed, uh, Woodpockatuck Wild and Scenic Stewardship Council, and uh, let's see if I missed anybody. In the town of South Kingstown, the Economic Development Committee, the South Kingston uh, Par uh, Conservation Committee, and the Highway Department. We're working to put medallions out on the basin so everybody knows that this drains to the water. My wife, Elise, and I started the this whole procedure this winter, and we're happy to see that it's gone a long ways, and we got some really great partnership, along with my friend Dennis Mignol, who represents South Kingstown to the Woodpockatuck Wild and Scenic Stewardship Council. I'll talk more about that later on. <laughs> there, did I get that all out? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just want to talk a little bit about river herring. You know, I mean, everybody asks questions, what are river herring? Well, they're an anadromous fish, and anybody know what that means? Anybody? Somebody? I know he does. She does. She does, of course. <laughs> so an anadromous fish is a fish that is born in fresh water and spends its entire life in salt water. So they spawn, right now they're spawning from the ocean. They spent their entire adult lives in the ocean and they're making their way up to drop eggs to spawn up in, in, in fresh water and then they'll return back out to the sea. They don't die, they'll return. So um, there are two di different types of herring. There are blueback herring and alewives. So to try to tell you what uh, to distinguish between, I couldn't. You know, the, the eye size is a little different, the body shape's a little different, but when you look down, they all look the same. They really do. 
So, um, anybody know what other types of anadromous fish there are? Salmon. Uh, salmon, absolutely. This fish that is a very good game fish around here, not just salmon, but stripers. Yep. Stripers, they, they breed in fresh water. You know, sturgeon, you know, they're, uh, there's shad. also uh, shad. shad, river shad, yep. So, you know, there's quite a few fish that, this, that come into the fresh water to, to lay their eggs. So anyway, just check my things. So right now the alewives are the first ones to arrive. They're the ones that are coming in. The blue blacks will come in a little bit later, you know, but again, you can't tell the difference. The alewives though are trying to make their way all the way up to Indian Lake. They like to, they like to breed in a, in a lake environment with stagnant water. You know, they'll lay their eggs in, on, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, on logs, rocks, you know, any kind of structure. Uh, so. Once they lay their eggs, they return to the sea, as I said before, those eggs will incubate in three to five days. They'll hatch. So these fish will remain in the lake, in Indian Lake, for upwards of three or four months, depending on weather conditions. So if it's heavier rains, they may leave earlier. If it's dry periods where the water's not flowing as much, they may stay in that uh, environment. So until they grow and get bigger. Now, some of the problems is predation. Obviously, there's a lot of bass in that pond. There's, pickerel, there's a uh, smallmouth bass, and herring this big are really tasty to them. So there's a lot of predation that occurs in the lake at that point. And right now, the uh, success rate of returning herring is less than 1%. So a female that lays 50,000 eggs, 500 of those fish will get to maturity level to come back and spawn in three to five years, typically. So a lot can happen in that three to five years, right? Herring are very tasty. They love to be eaten out in the ocean. There are so many things that like to eat herring. Whales, dolphins, striped bass, tuna, uh, you know, bluefish. Seals. Seals, you name it, everything. They're high in omega fats. They're, you know, if you ever handled a herring, you smell your hand out, it, it smells really strong. So that's the oils in the fish. It's really a very strong, and the fish love it because it has high nutritional value. So. And, and let me, while, you, while they come in, once they get into the river system, there's another bunch of creatures that are after them. Cormorants, yep. right there. Seagulls, ospreys, yep. and then we get further up, you have raccoons and other, and the other mammals, that otters that feast on these things. If you want, if there's a fish that you want to be, a herring is not one that you yes. want to be because everybody wants to uh, eat you. Absolutely. And actually, if you ever come by here and you'll see a seagull perched on top of that roof right there, I'm sure you've seen it, or perched on top of this dam, just looking down, you know the, river, the herring are running at that point because they're not here for, you know, they're just here to check it out. They're here for a reason. Right. And same with the cormorants. And if you see, you know, the, uh, what do you call it, the ospreys. Yeah, the ospreys. The first time you see an osprey, you know the river herring is showing up. Because right. they, they time their arrival here around the exact time that the river herring are coming. Because it's a main staple in the early season. There's not a lot of the other fish that they f normally feed on here earlier, except for river herring. So ospreys are here, you know the river herring are here. So uh, one of the things that has happened with river herring over time has been destruction of habitat, right? Uh, there's been, you know, water It's not, the quality is down so you know they can't reproduce as well you have overfishing uh, one of the things that happened back in uh, I think it was uh, two years they passed a, a moratorium on dragging right off the beach that was important because you know when the herring were running they were coming up you'd see the draggers right off the Narragansett Beach going up and down and they they drag at the mid-level column and they just wipe out an entire you know river herring uh, you know and it typically it's a bycatch too if you're fishing for something else they'll scoop, scoop up the river herring. Now, once they're scooped up, they're dead, yeah. right? There's nothing you can do. So in 2005, I believe, uh, the state of Rhode Island outlawed anybody in possession of river herring. So you cannot catch river herring in any of the rivers. You know, before you could go down with kids and scoop up some you know, river herring and, and use it for bait for striper, which is a very effective bait. Um, but in 2005, because uh, the stocks were collapsing, they, they, they put a moratorium on it, which is still in existence today. So, and in 2017, they did an analysis also of the, the stocks and the, they're still at historically low levels 
across the entire coast wide. Now, certain rivers, like this river in particular, is doing well. You know, it, the numbers are starting to uh, increase. I think, I'd like to think it had a lot to do with our, our, our group working on, you know, helping the, the river herring up. But, uh, you know, we are still coastal wide. The numbers have been down. So we're, we're working the best we can here. Obviously, I don't have control all over the place, but we're working the best we can here to make sure the numbers keep increasing. So. How many remember seeing people sitting on boards over here, lifting the fish over before this dam was fixed? We were one of them. Yeah. And once this fish, fish ladder got corrected, the herring could be moved through easily. But before this fish ladder was put in, and before this dam was put in, they used to say that the river would turn silver with the amount of herring that would run up here. In fact, in colonial times, part of paying their debt to, to Europe, they would salt herring and send it back, and they would use it for an important part of fertilizer for their crops because they didn't have horses yep. and cattle as much as they did. Herring was an important thing for fertilizer and for paying their debt because salted herring is what Europe seems to love. So we've just, but what really stopped, it slowed everything down were the dams. So I didn't mean to jump into the dams. No, 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 that's okay. No, I mean, right. that's so, a perfect segue into the river. Right, so, you know, in the 1700s is when this first road was put across the river here and linked Post Road into Main Street, and then this whole area started to develop. In fact, when we go around the corner, you're gonna see a traffic cone. That's where there was a grist mill and a sawmill and probably the original timber dam that kept collapsing all the time. And maybe the heron made it through, but that was shutting the door for the migration. It wasn't until the 1860s that this permanent structure got put in. And that was the end of that, of any type of migration until the 1970s when the first fish ladder put in. And I believe that was meant for really designed for like salmon and yes. the river herring yep. had a tough time with it but they didn't make it through but it's amazing once you open the door they start to come back and our yep. and our goal is to continue this all the way up so yeah so if you want to just talk about the river sure. and uh, you know in general before you leave check out that that little message board over there because it explains how the fish migrate from there all the way up to indian lake and if you walk up to different segments of the river especially in peacedale just walking along the river, you may get lucky and actually see the herring in shallow spots. There is a big, uh, a, a good population of them up at Indian Lake right now as they're working their way into there. But, uh, you know, we, as, as humans, the first thing we did was shut everything down and it just stopped it. And it just didn't stop it for the river herring. It stopped it for the migration of the, the trout, for the salmon. And you know, the brook trout was a big thing in here, the shad. If everybody knows what a shad bush is, the idea of the name became because it blooms when the shad runs. But that did, the shad, I don't think, run in this river anymore. Hopefully someday that they will. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was, just, that was a big change in the river. And the downside of a dam is that rivers around here are, are really meant to run narrow, deep, and cool. The minute you put a dam in, it widens out, silt collects, and it starts to warm up. And species like lip, uh, brook trout can't survive anymore. And we have an invasive species, the largemouth bass, the calico bass that are in these ponds now, along with the other things like the, the, the aquatic plants like the milfoil and the fanwort. They're not supposed to be here. They're choking the water out. It's making it difficult for other species to survive. So we really did a heck of a job when we put these dams in and as humans. So fortunately, we have a, you know, we're environmentally minded now. We're trying to do the best we can to at least return it as best as we can to the way it was. So, yay for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> what about the, um, the, the uh, at Peacedale, at the mill there, do you have to lift the... the palisades. Oh, palisades? Yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about, all, I'm gonna talk about the uh, fish ladders and palisades. That's gonna be a whole segment that we're gonna transition So she asked us about the palisades fish ladder and Paul says we're gonna talk about that yes. a little bit later because yep. that's, that's involved, so. Yep. so. So with our group, we're involved with the URI Watershed Watch. The idea is, and Watershed Watch collects data from all the lakes and ponds through volunteers all over the state. And my wife, Elise, who's been working with the, uh, the Watershed Watch, has been compiling data on this, on this whole area so we can have an archive of information so if things ever do change, we can see how the river was. And it's important for our group to generate funding to be able to, to continue these sites the Salt Ponds Coalition funded the site over by the dock. We're going to fund 
the uh, site in Saugatucket Pond, which is upriver from here, and another site to be determined. We haven't quite figured out where yet. So we're hoping this year we'll have three sites that we collect data, and we'll do it for the, hopefully we'll, we're gonna sustain, get some sort of funding where we can sustain this down the road. So we're always gonna have proper data so we can go back and work on. So that's what we're doing with that. The, uh, the towns working with us, with the medallions, are offering us these things to put on the basins. We'll need volunteers if you're willing to help us out. That's probably going to happen in March, or I'm sorry, May. It's too late for March. Uh -huh. And uh, we're going to do it all throughout the town. And that between that and Save the Bay is going to work with us. And uh, we're moving right along for a new organization. We're cranking right along. And, we, and Paul and I and our two groups are working hand in hand constantly in contact, constantly working together, constantly keeping ourselves communicated with the communications between the town and DEM, is dealing with government, can be involved. And uh, so we're very fortunate that we have this type of relationship between the two organizations. So back to you. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, the River Herring obviously come originate in uh, uh, Point Judith Pond. They come actually from the ocean into Point Judith Pond and they start to make the trek up to Indian Lake right here. So it's about a seven and a half mile run, roughly, you know, as the, as the lake uh, or the river goes. So what happened in 1965, the U.S. government passed the Anadromous Fish Act, which gave funding to the states to allow them to put in fish ladders to bypass these dams, man-made structures that really cut off the ability for these fish to get to the where they need to, to migrate, to, to spawn. So this ladder, along with the ladder that's up at Palisades, which is about a mile up, up river from here, were designed uh, for larger fish, for salmon. So what happens is, is really it, it determines the slope. It, you know, river, river herring need a, a lighter, lighter slope. So salmon can really swim up a, a steeper slope because they're stronger fish, they can jump. You know, river herring, they don't jump. They can't navigate over. If there's any kind of obstruction, they can't get over it. So, uh, so what that these two ladders here were designed for larger fish, not this one that's here now, right? There was one that was here previously. So our group, when that the previous one that was here, the fish would come up, bypass the opening which used to be at the base of the uh, of the road, right? Or uh, excuse me, the bridge. They used to, it used to like take a right angle and go right in underneath where you can see the heavy running water before it goes under the bridge. That was the entrance to the old ladder. The fish would just bypass it and go right to the base of the dam. And they can't go any further. They would stack up. So as volunteers, we would sit, you know, you, you said you saw the guy with the, the board. He was a big, heavy guy who would sit there with a net and sling the fish up and over the, uh, uh, the dam here. We did close to 10,000 fish one year. And because they just totally bypassed, they, they said, I can't make it up there. I'm not even going to try. And they end up and they get stuck at the base and then we would lift them up and over. So it was great, you know, but that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, a bandaid. And so, you know, we petitioned uh, NOAA and DEM to replace this uh, ladder because it's not working. So they, they designed this new ladder here, which is absolutely working great. You know, we're no longer needed to lift any fish here. And there's an osprey coming to take a look. Um, so, and, and it's working perfectly. Now, unfortunately, they get through here. You know, you got a gauntlet, right? <laughs> you got a few things waiting for them. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I, I couldn't time that more perfectly. <laughs> uh, so once they get by here, now they head up to uh, Palisades. So the problem with Palisades was the same problem that's here. It works great in low flow situations. It works great in low flow situations, but it works terrible in high flow situations. So right now we have a high flow situation. We just had a lot of rain. That water is rushing through that, uh, that ladder and the fish, what happens? They get to that point, they try to make it up and they get shot right back out, right? It's just, it's too heavy for them. They get tired about halfway up and they get, so now they congregate at the base of that ladder and they don't go any further. Or worse, they try to go around the mill and the river, the Saugatucket River, comes over the dam. There's a dam behind Lillipads, which is a professional building. You know, I don't know if anybody knows that in town. So there's a dam there during a high flow like this is go water's going over the dam. The fish sense that. They fish the, the movement of the water and they're like, oh, here's another way. And then they get to the base of the dam 
water recedes, the fish get stranded, they die. So last year there was a fish killed, probably 2,000 fish died at the base of that dam. You had heavy flow, got cut off, and then they can't make it back. So we're needed at the base of that, at the Palisades Dam. We've done it a few years, and this year we had an issue with the mill owner who didn't want us on his property because of liability issues. I get it. Now, he has every right, and you know, I tried to work with him early on. We kind of hit a roadblock. Word got out that he wasn't allow us to lift the fish, and then some people reached out to him, emails, emails, emails. I gave him a, an opportunity uh, through a hold harmless agreement, and he said, okay, that sounds all right. So we worked through a lot of the issues. We uh, gave him a proof of insurance, uh, and now we're actually going to start lifting uh, as early as next week and potentially next weekend have a big lift at the base of the dam, which is great because right now the fish are probably starting to stack up there. So, um, and then once they get beyond that, the, the dam there, it's free sailing right up to Indian Lake for them. They go through the Saugatucket Pond, they cross over uh, the Saugatucket Road. Saugatucket Road up, up to Saugatucket River. Yeah. Then they take a left up Fresh Meadow Brook, go under Broad Rock Road, yep. up to the entrance to the village of Indian Lake. From there, they go up all the way through their property, and then there's a step, I don't know if, you, if it's really a step ladder. It's really not a ladder like this, but it's a step area where the fish can work up their way, and there's pools step where they pools. can rest. Yeah. Step pools. Yep. Where they work their way up into Indian Lake, and there's some there now. So it's, it's a lot easier than, they don't have to deal with the complication of the weakest link, which is right now in Palisades. Yeah. So that right now, DEM's working with Palisades and, and the mill owner to redesign that ladder. Uh, I can't tell you where they are in the, uh, in the negotiations because you know, I'm not privy to them. But you know, the ultimate goal is that we're no longer needed to touch the fish. Anytime you touch the fish, you introduce the possibility of disease, uh, mortality. You, know, you could injure the fish. I mean, if you get a net full of fish, like we used to hear, there's 30 fish in the net. You don't want to be the one on the bottom. That's right. Right? You know, it's like a pig pile. You don't want to be the one on the bottom with 30 people on top of you, right? So that, if we eliminate our, one of my uh, primary functions as a group, I'm great. I'm cool with that. You know, that's better for the fish. Nobody touches them. They make their way naturally from, from start to finish and back out. So, yeah. And this, this isn't the only run in town. They, they came in all the salt mm -hmm. ponds over the years. And there's one in Green Hill, same issue. It's got a weak link in the whole process that's probably going to be the river herring in our group or his group with yep. me involved uh our next process once we get that straightened out so yep. it's not you know it's, there's a lot going on and there's a lot to do but uh but keeping the river pristine as best we can yep you know we're never going to get it back to where it should be but we're going to have a earth day cleanup on the 25th so while paul's get lifting fish on the 25th we'll be out here in kayaks <laughs> In, in, in looking for volunteers, go to our web, it's uh, friends of the .org. And you can not only, or on Facebook, we're on Facebook. I want to see some of our social media. Can you send me something that I can put on our social media? Yep, sure, I sure can. You'll see video that I've taken of these fish working up through the fish ladder and up at Indian Lake. And it's the coolest mm -hmm. thing because there's thousands of them. It looks like just massive chaos going back and forth mm -hmm. and it's amazing because if you've never seen one they're about this big they're not just little things they're about this big so so, so next sunday let's help pick up some trash and we're <laughs> not just doing it here on the river we're doing it on main street and kingstown road anywhere that the water flows you know indian run brook rocky brook all those areas where the kids park to go to the high school that area is load of a trash we're going to be picking that up so you need to bring gloves bags and bright colors and you're going to do a good thing for the earth day weekend so. and then we're going to meet at nine o'clock that's why my wonderful wife is here <laughs> nine o'clock at old mountain field parking lot to just to give assignments it's social distance all we're going to do is give you an area to go pick up you, you take the bags you fill them up and you leave them on the sidewalk and a group comes by picks them up takes them to the town the town's going to take them to Johnston, and that's good. So, <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Busy weekend next weekend for all of us. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? I, I'm looking in this direction, and that looks like a prime runoff. So you can see 
with the blue car, they just close up. Yep. And it looks like it comes right down into does, the Does, yep. There. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yep. It, right. That should be fixed, right? Well, there's a lot of things. Yes, and her question was, is there looks like a runoff from the parking lot into the river, and should that be fixed? And she's absolutely right, and that's a slow process. If you notice the parking lot over there, there's a rain garden. Water from the parking lot that used to go directly into the river now gets detained there. And, of course, there's an overflow spot. That way it has a chance to percolate into the ground instead of just running into the river. That's something that the Economic Development Committee is probably going to work on when they look at the river and what's the best way to address it. Also removing invasive plants on that side of the river, clean up that fence a bit, maybe work on here and find out the ways to straighten out, the, uh, stop getting from as much storm water as we're getting into the river. All of uh, Old Tower Hill Road was reconstructed to detain the water instead of just letting it run down mm -hmm. because from there it runs down and eventually comes into the river. So th th that process is, is being worked on throughout the town. It's going to take a long time to get it all addressed. Yeah. Whew. Yep. How long are they there? And then they just That's a great question. I, we're not sure how long they, they stay. You know, I, I would say probably a couple weeks tops. I mean, they're, they're getting up there doing their business. I mean, they're not messing around. It's not like a vacation for them. So they get up and lay their eggs. And then once they lay it, they're, they're out of there. Once they've spawned, they come back out. Right yep. Back right back the same way. And is it, do they just go back down the ladder? Yeah. What they do is they'll face the current, and if you ever watch them do it, they'll face the current and just like slowly go down. It's not like they shoot down head first. They're kind of facing towards the, the water rushing, and then they back themselves down. The, it's a lot easier going down than going up, I can tell you that much. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, th just repeat the question. She so, asked, how do they imprint on their home river yep. and know how to come back? That, that's a great question, because uh, what happens when they it happens in the infant stage? Obviously, the egg hatches and they they get like almost like a, uh, a scent of the lake and the water. So it gets ingrained into their I don't want to say their DNA, but it gets ingrained into the fish so that when they out migrate, I mean, these fish travel thousands of miles. They go out in the ocean and they're going all over the place, right? And they're getting predated on the whole time. They all come together, right? From all the different river systems. And then when the springtime comes along and they don't know why, but they all just go their own ways to go back to the rivers that they were born. So that they're, it's not like, you know, uh, a herring that was born in the, uh, over at Gilbert Stewart decides, oh, I'm going to go Saugatucket this year. Yeah, I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to do, no, they go back to the river. They have, they, it's the sense. They can smell it and they just continue up that path till they get to their destination. But if you ever go up to Indian Lake and you watch how they get into the lake, you know, the last cut, there's a little, like a triangular cut out of the pool. You'll see one go through and it'll like just start around like, oh, wh where am I? What the heck's going on? Then another will come through and then they join up together and then another and then another until it's like a school of fish and they're racing around in circles. And then when it gets to, I don't know why it gets to a certain number that does, but then they, they go, all right, let's go. And then they all traverse into the middle of the lake. Okay. No, no, no. It comes in uh, Indian Lake Shores. There's a clubhouse. Uh, yeah, off of Broad Rock Road. Big water, table rock. Yep. Right. So there's a clubhouse, and it is private property. So if you do happen to go there, please respect their property. And you know, uh, you go, you park at the clubhouse, and you walk. You can see the lake right in front of you, and you'll notice a bridge that goes over, like it connects to the other side. Like there's, and underneath is that little concrete. Um, pools that they've that DEM, DEM has uh, put in that allows the fish to go basically step up to get into the lake. So right now, uh, from what I hear, the, the pools are quite full of fish. Right. So and they go from one pool to the next, and it really it takes a lot out of them. They're resting in each pool until they get to the final one. But then once they get in the lake, it's it's really pretty cool to see. But and these fish, they're krill and plankton eaters. Yep, they're filter feeders. The minute they start the process for spawning, they stop eating. They stop eating. They don't eat any time this whole, during this whole process. 
The yep. whole trip and the whole trip. Well, I don't know the whole trip back, but I'm assuming that they don't. Yeah. But and I'm sure they must have the munchies once they make it back out to sea. But it's just quite amazing. They have one thing on their mind, and that's to lay their eggs, to spawn, and to make it back. And just to think, they came through Point Judith. These fish here came through Point Judith Harbor, came all the way up to Salt Pond, came up through this. Imagine going up all these rapids, and then it's just, this is just this is a third of the way there. Yeah. All the way up to the spawn, and go back without eating anything. Yeah. Yeah, one, less than 1%, so 500 or less. Yeah, yep, predation, predation is uh, obviously, you can see here, uh, and actually the, the little ones are getting predated on as soon as they're born, you know, in the Indian Lake, all those fish there are like, oh, it's, you know, it's a buffet for them. So uh, once they get out, I mean, obviously, if you ever come down here, like in the fall, you'll see striped bass on the other side of that uh, dam uh, street, and you look down, you'll see the stripers, they're waiting for the, the herring to come out. So these things come out of here and they got a gauntlet to go through. So, I mean, you, 1% is actually, I think, a pretty high number if you really think about it because, and then they get out and then the whales, the dolphins, the tuna, everything. Cod? No, they spawn once a year. The young are leaving, they can leave anywhere from July to October and that all depends on weather conditions, uh, water levels, uh, you know, so if it's, yeah, if we have a, a, a rainy summer, the water level might be such that they'll, they'll out migrate in July or August. But if it's been a dry summer and the water levels are low, they may come out in September or October. Yeah. Yeah. They're yep. opportunists, right. Yeah, whenever. they're opportunists. They'll, whenever it's available to them, they'll, they'll uh, get out at that point. It's pretty oh, amazing. I'm sorry. They can live in fresh water all the time if they if they wanted to, but they're just here to spawn. Like there are some uh, there are instances where river herring get landlocked, and they can live in that in that water for you know a couple of years, but. Their, their preference is to get out and get back into the ocean where their their feeding is you know like you said the krill and the uh, and right. the and the plankton there, were, there was a problem with one of the Great Lakes where a series of river herring were trapped and became landlocked and they became an invasive species because they were eating all the the uh, the krill and things that other fish would eat and there was no predator so they became a problem but they can ha that that can happen so and if you ever hear Somebody say, yeah, the river herring are here, but what about the buckies? Same thing. These buckies. things, yep. L-wives. River herring are called L-wives. They're also called buckies, buckeyes, uh, buckboard, buckboard herring, I've heard them called. And I think they call saw them- Sawbellies. Sawbellies. <laughs> yep. They have all sorts of cool names. And I think the name buckies came because they had big eyes like a, like a deer, and, and it was buckeye. And then, you know, here yep. in Rhode Island, we love changing names, so it's- <laughs> Buckies, and yep. I grew up. We used to go to Gilbert Stewart's to scoop the Buckies with yep. my dad. So it's kind of like a, a a thing of passage around here. And when I heard saw bellies, I'm like, oh, because when you handle the fish, and the belly will cut your fingers sometimes. So we would grab like if a fish popped out of the net, you reach over, you grab the fish, and you throw it over, and you look down, you're bleeding. It's like what? Oh, saw bellies. The, the saw bellies. <laughs> yep. So, so there is um, at the mouth of this where it comes in at the top of the uh, ladder, there's a whiteboard. If you look down, uh, if you come by actually and you see people who are just staring down, it looks like, well, why are they staring there? They're the fish counters. They're looking at that whiteboard to see the fish go over and they'll say, you know, they'll have a clicker, one, two, three, you know, and then they have to do a 10 minute period. And what they do is they document that with DEM. You can do it through our website too. We have a connection to their DEM, uh, the Google, uh, I forget what that, Google Forms. So you go in there, you document it, it goes right up to, it loads right up to DEM real time. So yeah, so that you can actually come over if it's a beautiful day and you know, look down, you know, you're gonna see fish come across, especially yeah. now with all those fish below, there's gonna be a good run of fish coming up. Right. The water level's gotta drop a bit. Um, 
She wants to know why they have saws <laughs> on their belly. Well, their their bellies are so sharp, like it comes together so that it really, it, it like if you run your hand across it, it can cut you. It and that's like why they call them saw bellies. Yeah. It just, but it's not really a saw. It's just very sharp because of the way the body contour comes together. And your hands really smell afterwards too. <laughs> so it's really cool with the effort of this group and over the years because the population here is so good DEM has actually taken fish out of here yep. and put them in Warden's Pond so they can migrate down the Pawkatuck River because the Pawkatuck River had dams for so many years and, and right now they're talking about removing the there's two dams left the Potter Hill and the Shannock Dam. Shannock's got a great fish ladder they're taking they're going to take down the Potter Hill Dam but just to seed that area so the fish can spawn in, 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 in Warden's Pond and their offspring can go and come back. So this, the, the fish in this river are helping out different rivers through our town and through other parts of South County. Would they take the fish coming up and then let them lay their eggs? They take the eggs or what do they do? They take the fish, they take let the them fish. lay their eggs. So they'll take they the hatchery back. truck. They'll take the hatchery truck, net the fish, put them in the hatchery truck and, and truck them over to, to Warden's Pond. So there's actually a river that connects Tucker Pond to Warden's Pond. Yeah, Bucky Brook. Uh, it's Al yeah, it's, or it's Alewife Brook. Brook. Alewife Brook. <laughs> Thank so, you. So yeah, Bucky Alewife, whatever. Yeah, right. So, uh, but yeah, so at some point they had to have been going. Their ultimate goal was probably Tucker Pond, right? But now, I mean, I, I went over. We went. It's a land trust property. You go back in there and you look at that river. There's a lot of obstructions. There's a, yeah. I, I highly doubt that they're getting all the way to Tucker Pond now. Right, right. And you so have culverts good. that go through. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's highly unlikely that they are, but they could be. Right. right? If they're getting into uh, Warden's Pond, then they have to traverse a couple of culverts and they can make it to Tucker Pond. And the blueback herring, they don't, like Paul said earlier, they don't have to make it to a pond. They could spawn here in the river. Yeah. With they the, like running water. They like running water, so they don't have to go up as far. Yep. But the, the, the river herring, the alewives, have to make it to a pond. In the, but they could be also laying eggs in Saugatucket Pond. Yep. We don't know. All we know is they keep coming back every year in better numbers than they have in years yep. before. So something's happening correctly. Yep. Any other questions? Which is Saugatucket Pond? Excuse me? Saugatucket so Pond is actually where Lily Pads is, the professional oh. building. That pond that's behind there is called Saugatucket Pond. It's part of the river system, it's, but it's just, you know, it's between... It's an impoundment like yeah. this is. It's yeah, it's up like by this. The dam. Yep. No, it's predominantly it's a predominantly New England species. Right. You know, it does go, I think, as far south as North Carolina, I believe. And, and but it, the majority of the species is in the New England uh, states. Right. And there's a West Coast herring. There's herring yep. from different parts of the world. There are but ocean the herring, too. Yeah, there's, the, the Atlantic herring are more, I believe, from like Middle Atlantic up to New England and up to even further. I, I, I'm just, I would yeah, imagine Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Yep. So. The ones from Rhode Island, though, they don't pronounce their eyes, though. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. Yeah. Those yep. are the Buckies. Yeah, those are the Buckies, yeah. <laughs> Elise. I just had a layer on to how this work also benefits the catagrement species that support the right here in the field. Right. And um, they do the opposite. They spawn out at sea and then they live their lives in the river. Yep. Come on over here so that you can hear this. Yeah. Or, all right. Well, I can't pronounce <laughs> the term. The Which is the opposite. The eels. So the American gray eel, who lives in all these freshwater ponds, well, when it's time for them to spawn, we'll do the opposite. They'll leave. They'll go across the grass on a rainy day, find their way to a river, leave to go all the way out to the middle of the Sagrasso Sea in the Gulf Stream to spawn. They've never quite figured out where, but they know that they all mass together and spawn there. Then they, they make their way back along with their, their offsprings, which are called glass eels. And the fish ladder in Shannock has a specific ladder just for the eels to make sure that they make their way back up. So they're the opposite. But again, putting the dam in just shut the door to everything. Yeah. So we're glad the ladders are there to open, at least crack the door again so they can make their way through. Cool. Yeah, the Industrial Revolution was not kind to uh, fish that spawn.
Yeah. Say that, I'm sorry? The imprinting you were talking about, like the awareness of the body of water they're in. Yes. They're coming back to it. That happens when they are... When they're young. Yep. So she's asking yep. if the imprinting of the, the river happen, happens at birth when they're, they yes. hatch. Yep. It, it happens right when they, they hatch. It's, yeah. it's not like it, they, it get, they get it from the adults. It's something that they, they sense when they're growing up or they're, they're creating, you know, from a little hatchling to, you know, I think it's about two or three inches long when they start to out-migrate. I think that's when it gets embedded into the system. You know, I think they, they've tried to do DNA studies with the, the herring to see if there was... Hang on a second. Common. That gull has a herring in his mouth. Yeah, there you go. That's what they look like. That's it right there. Oh, look, they're chasing it. Everybody wants it. Yay! Thank you, Mr. Gull. I'll pay you later. So, yep, that's a river herring. But <laughs> that, no, that's a meal, actually. So, I don't even know what I was saying. <laughs> yep. But, oh, the DNA. Yeah, the DNA. So, they've done, uh, they continually do extensive studies. You know, I talked to Pat McGee, who's the state biologist. They haven't had a link to say, all right, this, this DNA for the Saugatucket River herring exists only in there. And, you know, Gilbert Stewart has a separate DNA that it, so far they, there's no distinguishable difference between the DNA. So it has to be something that's inherited from them when they're, when they're born. So, I mean, that's why when they take the river herring from here and throw them in Warden's Pond... I'm sure they're not happy about it. They're sitting, well, this isn't where I want to go, but they can't go anywhere else. They're going to spawn. You know, the herring just don't say, well, this isn't, this isn't right. I don't, there's no candles lit. I don't like the mood music. I'm out of here. No, they're going, to, they're going to say, all right, here it is. This is what we got. We might as well spawn and then find right. a way out. And she asks a great question. Once they spawn and everybody goes back out to sea, does the herring that spawn come back to the warden's pond or they come here? Well, we think they come back here, but their offspring will come back to warden's pond. Yep. And that's how the stock it, it, for that for the Pawkatuck River gets yep. built up. Yeah, because it's not very cost efficient to hatch the eggs and release the fry. You know, that's, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money for the state. And they're pretty much going to say, we'll do it this way. We'll transplant the fish, let them spawn naturally, and then, you know, that, that will be good. But one of the things too, if you've ever, if you've ever uh, heard of people ice fishing at Warden's Pond, right? One of the favorite baits is dead herring. Seriously, they catch big pike through the ice on herring, herring or bunker, you know, chunks. Instead of using, you know, sometimes they use shiners or something. No, they go, they buy the herring from a local bait shop, cut it up into chunks, and fish with that. Because yeah. you know the pike are that's what they're feeding on right now. She got a question. Well, that all depends on, uh, you know, they get three to five years is when they return. So, you know, obviously there's some mortality in spawning. And I think they can go up to like seven, yeah. seven or eight years, I think is the max. Um, but, I mean, it becomes very difficult for them. You know, obviously spawning is, is hard on them. I mean, if you ever go to an area and you look down, uh, you'll just see scales. Like up at uh, Indian, Lake. Indian Lake, you look down and it, and it looks like the whole uh, bed is covered in fish scales because they're trying to go over the concrete barriers and as they do they're scaling themselves basically and so when you do that now you're introducing potential you know disease or you know it's like so right. that's the problem is once they spawn they're not sure how many get predated or die as a result of the spawning but they'll know that you know after five years you'll know the young of the year will be coming back as well so it kind of gets interspersed you know you don't have you know, this whole batch dies, it doesn't. But a certain percentage, which they don't know, I mean, there's really no way of telling. You said that it's illegal to possess a herring? Yes. But how, so how do the bait shops get herring? That's, uh, uh, that's Atlantic herring. There, there's different, there's river herring right. and Atlantic herring. So, exactly. Uh, pike don't know the difference, they just know it's tasty. Yeah. But that used to be a big thing. You know, back when you could take the river herring, that was the, a big thing for bait. You know, my father used to go to Gilbert Stewart's and net them and keep them in a cage in Green Hill Pond and use them for striper bait. Uh, and that was a big thing. Yeah. And again, fertilizer, all those things. Back up to when, when did they close? You said, you said when did they close the uh, fishery for? It's 2006. 2006, all the way up until then. 
you could take herring. Yeah. Are the Atlantic herring uh, in danger? No. no. No, they spawn at sea. For overfishing? I don't know if anybody, you ever see wicked tuna? So you'll see, the, you know, the, the, they'll have like a fish finder and the stacking of the, of the herring from, you know, 15 feet below the surface down to 200 feet. It's just all red. And that's, those are schools of, of Atlantic herring. So yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're in good numbers. Yeah. I'm sure like anything else, the fishery is controlled so it doesn't get overfished. Yeah. Yep. The pair trawlers are not allowed to be within 10 miles of the coast right now. So you will see, like if you see trawlers along the beaches, that they're mostly going for uh, squid right now. So the squid are starting to run, so you'll see them going up and down the beach. But they could catch herring as bycatch. Right. They could. What do you think about all this? Pretty neat, huh? How many knew this, this all happened? I'm sure a lot of us did. But did yeah. yeah. And that's that's Yep. Well, that's always amazed me about 80% of the people that drive through the town have no idea, no clue what's happening in the water below them. Yep. So that's the goal of both Paul's group and ours is to educate everybody to what's going on into the river. Not just with the herring, but all the other species, but right now that's the important part. So they've seen the numbers, well, it, they crashed in like 2015. Uh, Coastal-wide, it was, it was really bad. But since then, uh, I think Pat McGee, uh, who's a state biologist, I asked him this the other day, and he said uh, last year the run was close to 100,000 fish. That's their estimate. Now, obviously, there wasn't somebody who was going on to the, up to 100,000. So, But definitely we saw a number of fish, yeah, just this river. Uh, Gilbert Stewart, I think, had 130,000 last year. So, you know, you have uh, the Pawkatuck, you have the Winoskotucket up in Providence, you got the 10 Mile River, which originates in East Providence. Right. You have a run over in Little Compton. You have uh, all these little runs that really aren't on the map, you know, that probably have a few thousand fish that go into. But, uh, you know, overall, I think there's like six major runs in the state, which have been over 100,000 fish last year. So that's good. Yeah, that's, that goes up to Gilbert Stewart. They're up there now. Yep. Yeah. So, so if you ever go to Gilbert Stewart's birthplace, oh, sorry. Yep. No, but that's good. Yeah, you go, you can go there and just, there's a fish ladder that goes right up to Gilbert Stewart. You'll see the fish right below that road there. It's actually a nice little area. It is. To go take a ride. So keep in mind, when you drive around, you're going to see names of roads. Bucky Brook Road. There's one in Charlestown, L. White Brook. The reason is, it's because that's where the herring used to run. Yep. Or, or still do. So they're about everywhere. Cool. So I was going to come in and just ask, um, what are the ways that we could help? Okay. Um, besides the Earth Day cleanup, is there times, um, other times or ways to help out both of your foundations? Well, with my with my group, uh, the River Herring Collective, you can get on our website, riverherringcollective.org. We're not a, we don't take donations. Everything we do is time. That's all it is. Is time. So a lot of people, especially. Uh, I would say the majority of the, our group does the counting. Now it doesn't seem exciting. You come down for 10 minutes, you record the number of fish you see, and you log it and you're done. And it helps the state biologist to determine how the, the, uh, the extent of the run is going. If you want to help with the cleanup of the river, that's something we do as well. And the lifting of the fish, I'm hoping this is the last year we have to do it here. It is fun, you know, it's a lot of fun to see them and handle them, but it's not good for the fish. So ultimately, we want to do away with that. But if you want to join the group and be, you know, uh, you can, there's no cost. We don't collect any money. You know, you can just get on, register, and, and you'll get all the emails and, and find out what we're doing. In our group, just River go, to, Herring, right go, here. go to our, uh, our, our just, just send us an work. email <laughs> at uh, friendsofthesaugatucket at gmail.com and uh, show an interest that you'd want to help out. We could put you on our mailing list. We're, we're trying to advocate for the river on a, you know, a year-round basis and a lot of different factors. We need to work with the town. We're trying to raise money for water quality monitoring. Uh, if you know of any business or anyone in town that wants to be involved, whether it's donating funds or, be, or just being a oh, volunteer sorry. monitor, my wife Elise volunteer, volunteer monitors for Potter Pond. I volunteer with her. Margaret does 
right here in the Saugatucket River. So there's a lot of people that do that. It's time consuming. You become citizen scientists and it's really rewarding. So that's one of the things you can help us with. Put medallions on the basins. There's a lot of things. Stand with us whenever they have a, uh, the Main Street events to kind of promote the organization. Lots of different things to do. Just get a hold of us. Come to our meetings. See what we're all about. We're still learning about ourselves. Yep. Maybe you can help us. Yeah. But do you guys both have Facebook pages as well? Yes, we, we do. do. Okay, perfect. Yep. We do. Yep, you'll see us posting on Facebook uh, and also the South Kingstown page. Uh, we'll post on that as well. Yep. When we do a lift, we'll, we'll show the results of that. We'll also yep. show, uh, you know, the Bucky's uh, running at, at certain points. Yeah. Videos that he takes. Yeah, check out our videos. They're really, really neat. Yeah. So. so thank you so much. I'm no, thank you. And the Green Stitch. It was such a great talk. We learned so much. Thank, thank you. you.